seconds. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Bruce said, my name is Kiran. I'm here to run this webinar today with Bruce. Um, Enoch is going to be our wonderful moderator in the chat room. So if you have questions, please go ahead and um, put them in the chat. We'll try to address them at the end. However, if time does run out, we, as Bruce said, we do have a Q&A session at 11 o'clock on this topic. Um, today, our webinar is going to be on really thinking about how you will reconceive or plan for um, your upcoming assessments and projects as we approach the end of the semester. You know, really, um, in this time where uh, things are changing really quickly and we're having to make adjustments as we go through the semester, um, it's definitely not an easy time. And it we and all of the challenges that you are experiencing. So we thank you for being here today to attend this session with us, um, 30 minutes. We'll have Bruce to begin the first few slides and then um, I'll take over towards the next half. Bruce, let's go. All right, thank you. And um, Kieran will go through this. Well, click on the slides for me. So good morning again, everyone. So we're looking at remote teaching. You know, this is an extraordinary time for us as we are um, trying to engage our students, trying to ensure that the learning continues. But we have to recognize that we have to kind of loosen the way that we would be teaching. Loosen it in a way that we don't like, but loosen it in a way that at least some learning is being taken place. There was, um, you know, there's no coursework and, and homework as it's such, because guess what? Every, everything is now homework. So all of that adds up on the students, notwithstanding that they also have the challenges of, of, of home. They, they have the challenges of um, access to um, the internet. They have, the, they have the, the challenges of trying to work. Yes, some of our students are still working. So how are they and how are us, how, how will this, sorry, the faculty kind of handle those um, remote assessments, remote exams, and recognizing that, yes, in the next three to four weeks, it's going to be the end of the semester. So moving on to the next slide. Here's what is traditional for us. All right, so traditional in the classroom, face to face. This is wonderful because now I'm getting to see my students face. And as I develop traditional exams, these are the items that I have to consider. You know, the paper, the multi choice. I, I can throw in some um, written, whether it's essay or what have you, and everything is on a fixed schedule. You know, we meet on Tuesday in Woodward 234 at 9 o'clock, and I'm going to have that exam run for one hour. And because physically, um, as a faculty is in the class with my TA, I am able to proctor. And not to worry, there's a student or students who need those accommodations of accessibility from disability services, not to worry, I can send them off to disability services for that support. That is a traditional. But here we are in this room, emergency remote or emergency online teaching. How are we going to replicate that in the online virtual world to get the exact traditional exam? My thought is that's not so. So now the university has um, given us this opportunity just in case we want to do that. We want to do a proctored that we can use Respondus Monitor and we can use the, the lockdown browser. And in, in some cases, it may be the, the, the best thing for us. I would say maybe it's the best thing for us if we have a small class um, and that all things being equal, every student has a laptop, Mac or Windows, that has a camera, but in the real world, it is not so. And therefore, Respondents Monitor and the lockdown browser may not be that recommended um, solution for our current situation. So here's what we are saying. Don't use the proctored exam. 
but find an alternate um, to doing so. So what are those reasons why we say um, don't use it? Well, there's stress. You know, I've, I've worked with faculty who have decided, Bruce, I'm gonna do the, the proctored, and suddenly they sent off a, a, a survey to the students and they found that they have essentially four to five students groups who are either meeting the ability to do proctored or will never be able to do the proctored. So not only are we stressing out the students, but we're also stressing out ourselves in, in doing that. The next challenge is that there's access. Again, we assume that all students have in the real world the correct device, but we never got the opportunity to put that in our in our syllabus to say all students must have at minimum X. And so the, the, the responders and the webcams and the Chromebook have provided that challenge that now puts an added responsibility for us to get that planning and setup and testing um, that is also adding stress um, to the proctored exam. Another one is the whole matter of privacy. Privacy concerns, so the, the next option um, is that um, students are, are, are probably uh, uh, feeling a little weird that somebody is recording them or watching them over their camera while they're doing this. There's those privacy um, concerns, but it's, it's, it's not because we don't trust, but we're trying to put in something that um, there is a level of integrity with the exam. And this is what we're trying to do with the best of intentions. Unfortunately, it, it's not working so. And then the last one is accommodations. We need to provide accommodations for the students, but not so much only those who need that accommodation in terms of accessibility, but for those students, as I said, in, in, in the above where they don't, they're using Chrome, they don't have a webcam, and for some reason respondents cannot install, we have to provide alternative assessments or assignments for those students. And so my thought is, with all of these five, these are the challenges that are saying to us, don't use Proctor. So what should we use then? Then we have to look, consider some alternate assessments for all students so that we can have equal accommodation and equal access and reduce stress for us and the students. So we're urging you on this webinar and to take it upon yourself to think beyond exams, think beyond quizzes, think beyond tests, which are typically what we conceive as fixed answer assessments. There's one answer typically, or everybody has to do the same kind of assessment. Um, and I know that this is a thought that might cause you to think, to go in a little panic, but here we are saying, please don't panic. Um, it's actually quite easy to think about how we could, you know, address a new type of assessment or, or a, an alternative type of assessment. And we're going to approach this in, in sort of three ways, right? Number one, uh, go through the rest of the webinar. We're going to look at some of the principles that you should keep in mind as you rethink assignments. And we're going to offer you some ideas or strategies on how you can do it. Um, what would be some, some strategies you could try even today, even next week? And how would you actually follow through and give instructions to your students to do these new types of new modes of assessment? Okay. So we look at the first one. The first one is on principles. So we like to go by a little code called silly principles. And really three principles with um, S, S, L, L, and L, L. So let's imagine that you have about three weeks left for assessments. And as we approach the end of the semester, we really do have about three to four weeks left. So, you know, it's typical that you might have an exam plan, a final exam plan, which is maybe a big, heavy, high stakes exam, which might last anywhere from one to three hours. The first technique or first principle that I want you to keep in mind, you know, as you think about making any alternates is 
how can I make my big, a, a big exam a series of assessments? Right? So how can I space them out over time such that my students may not feel this giant stress on the last week? And I as a faculty or you as a faculty also will alleviate the same level of anxiety or stress that may be occurring. So one idea is instead of a giant exam, that's maybe a long cumulative or comprehensive type of exam, break it up in smaller exams that students can address. So what happens is the smaller exam is manageable. It's also less stressful. It's also probably going to set them up for success because um, research has shown that frequently spacing out the exams, which we call spaced learning no? or spaced practice, um, is actually more um, effective in terms of retention of knowledge rather than having one at the end that most likely students tend to kind of cram for. If exams are not your thing, and maybe that's going to be difficult, you might want to think about reconverting there's really no word converting your exam into um, more asynchronous projects where students can kind of work through an activity to demonstrate the same skills or demonstrate the same amount of learning but again in smaller pieces over time right so the principle is can I break a big assessment that's typically done in a usual semester at this time into small? Because our time is not the way that we normally conduct our time, right? There's other challenges that go through at home. There's other challenges that go through at, with family, personal, maybe even parents, and maybe even just generally, um, you know, managing this learn from home situation and teach from home situation. It's different. So we want to help everybody do things easier and set people up for success. And this is some of the, this is one principle to look at it. The second principle, which is the double L, the first double L, is think about love and think about life, right? So the first is, is there a way that instead of us as faculty having to think of projects for students that they need to do because of the time that we have maybe we could ask the students to work on something they love right that relates to the topic maybe we can redesign the project we give students an opportunity to connect something that they're experiencing in real life to these projects so to call this love life no um just because sometimes um in times when we have challenges with learning and challenges with with a new mode of teaching Maybe we can build engagement by um, creating an opportunity for students to work on things that are interesting to them and it's closer to their heart and it's closer to their life. Then they won't feel it's so much of a chore or a task or something that's forced to be done. And maybe even they might enjoy it and it uh, becomes memorable, no? Uh, same for you as a faculty, you might even enjoy reading or working on um, responses from students that are relevant to the today or something more interesting to students. And the third one, which we like to call the double L, the second double L is low tech and low stress. You know, we cannot re-emphasize that we might really have to rethink that how could we reduce the time spent on assignments where it's synchronously done with others, done over a timed experience, like a timed exam. If we imagine a world where students may not have all access or or in or complete um, maybe uh, what you call um, congruent access to technology or congruent access to internet, we should uh, provide a way where the assessments will almost automatically accommodate this. Right, and this causes low stress on the student and low stress on us as faculty. So these are the three principles. Um, that you know, we'd like to think of. Again, we remind ourselves that we are really in a um, different environment just for now, right? Really temporary, and we have to really think of how we and our students are promoting self-care, 
child care maybe, elder care if they have anybody that taking care of at home like parents or um, grandparents. And even I like to use this word world care, you know, where um, I can imagine even a me every day, I, I worry for the uncertainty that comes in the future. I worry about the news. I worry about the people that I hear who are getting uh, affected. So, you know, we do have a natural sense to be care, care, and this creates a bottle of stress that we almost have to acknowledge that it's via it's real. Um, we also have issues of equity. In a lot of articles online by inside higher head, uh, inside higher ed, the Chronicle Edu course that is talking about students um, having some um, lack of access. Um, additional ac accommodations that need to be given to students towards the end of the semester and even considering accessibility for students um, any any form of disability so we also want the digital divide you know this this funny um, picture really might be a reality for some where Wi-Fi really is the most important thing right now for communication most importantly, and then also, of course, for accessing information and learning materials for school. We might want to also think about that if um, there are some students who live with parents or live with families, they might have to share devices with others, share devices with their uh, siblings or with their parents, share devices with, um, uh, yeah, and again, we talk about some of the other things like connection, lack of maybe access to tools. So just being very cognizant of the reality that we have today. Um, again, so we promote these principles, particularly in this time. Okay, so the second um, focus for for today is the that we understand the principles. How do how could we do it better? How else could we do it as an alternate? Okay, so we're going to look at some techniques imagine that you have how many weeks do you have left always imagine the end right imagine the end in mind and think about if i have three weeks and my students have three weeks what can be accomplished in reality for three weeks let's take an example if the goal really is to have a writing assignment like students have to demonstrate a goal that they should be able to write out ideas and organize ideas Right, the first strategy, which we call S1, might be instead of the paper being due towards the end, we might want to break it apart into smaller pieces where students are, are starting to work on it earlier and perhaps even getting feedback on the pieces. As, right, so having um, an initial submission of an outline or a bibliography is already gathering evidence that students are learning, students are working on something. Again, we're trying to manage engagement and manage the students' workload. So thinking about spacing them out, an outline followed by a draft or a revision, and then having the final paper at the end. Okay, so this allows us to now break this giant task that students need to work on, which most likely is hard to focus right now, into more manageable pieces. Second strategy. Instead of a giant exam, change or modify this to a project, right? Can the students demonstrate their understanding by working on something more concrete to, ap to apply a theory, maybe to apply a method or a process that they have learned in the class, right? Instead of the test checking whether the theory is understood, have them apply the theory or apply it to something more concrete. In that case, a project is very easy for them to just submit at the end, but uh, we would encourage you again to take them through a process, right? So that they are building up their work, time, setting them up for success. Maybe you start with a proposal and then have them do a prototype or some kind of uh, demonstration that the project is being worked on. Right? It could just be a project draft even. And then, um, Maybe at the end, it's just polishing where you give some feedback or peers feedback and then they are improving it as they go. And we're not expecting perfect work on this kind of um, environment, but we are expecting the students to demonstrate some form of learning that meets the goal. Okay. Third strategy. What if you had labs? 
right? And you were, your class really was more lab based. So it's typical that you might have a situation where students have to work on some kind of process, you know, where they work with data or they work with, um, you know, some kind of analysis software or work with some kind of reporting. So thinking about the process of a lab, um, what are the skills you want the students to work on to build lab skills? Right? So lab skills would probably include ability to observe a phenomenon, design a study, collect data, analyze data, and report on data. Right? So thinking about that, so you'd step, step aside and say, I have three weeks, four weeks. Can my students? Is it manageable in an online environment? If they cannot observe a phenomenon in a real life, can they observe it in another way by maybe watching a video or um, using existing data that they could now jump a few steps ahead instead of collecting the data? Maybe they're going to just work on the analysis and the report, right? Because still the goals are being met. We're trying to think about what are the goals that we could not compromise goals, but compromise the complexity and you know the the amount needs to be done. But still reducing that a little bit so that we are loosening the environment, but providing them opportunities to learn. We have about two more uh, strategies here. So we've gone through writing projects. We've gone through labs. Number four, performances. I mean, maybe you are coming from an arts um, background and your students have to be able to demonstrate physically something right so maybe they have to put on a show it could be a dance it could be a, a song it could be made to voice out something um, or show you that they could do it so in, in a in a typical um final exam scenario um, students would be performances you know at midterm and finals and these would be in a in a stage would this would be in you know with an audience but in this kind of environment this is not possible especially that we are from uh, social distancing so maybe we break apart this performance into smaller pieces you now having something they could do at home and having maybe part one and part two so it's manageable you know, if students are going to have to video themselves doing a performance, this again might be their first time. So they would have to have the time to practice, to prepare the equipment if they have any. Now, so accommodating um, how we could break apart performances into smaller pieces and other ways to demonstrate that they could understand or do the performance. Last one is um, reflection. No, so it's likely that maybe some of these activities are not for you and your students are are maybe more discussion based in the classroom. You have, um, you know, group discussions in your class then um, and you want to kind of carry this along towards the semester. So you might want to have some discussions over the next few weeks that's more focused on the topic. But then at the end, maybe instead of a discussion, big discussion at the end with large requirements, you might want to just change that to a self-reflection point or a reflective paper where um, the students take a moment and sort of think through what they've done through the semester and write out sort of a, a learning map or a learning component, what they have understood so far or what they're taking away with them. What I love about reflection is sometimes you can combine the, the plan a little bit, mix it up a little bit. So maybe you can add reflections uh, on, on some of the other. Right? So a writing activity might have a reflection point at the end of a peer review. A project at the end may have a self-reflection. You know, um, Bruce and I were talking yesterday and he was the one who told me that once you do a project the first time, typically you really don't know what happened because you're doing it the first time. But if you take a moment to step back and say, huh, what have I accomplished? What have I done? Was this good? Could I do better? You know, what can I learn from others? Then suddenly it becomes more meta. And you know, you it it you, you appreciate your work differently. Right. So we actually encourage sort of these concepts of maybe adding a reflection, a peer review, or a critique for if it's a more performance-based at the end or even your final week 
with these, right? So you can still keep the flow where students are writing a paper, but towards the end, the focus is now on improving the paper, not so much completing it to the best possible way. Or maybe they have project, and at the end there's a reflection. Maybe the um, data lab, the data analysis for the lab is instead of a formal report, it's now a poster or a presentation to lighten up sort of the writing part at the end, right? Uh, and a performance, maybe instead of two, it's just one. And there's a critique after of other performances that you could do on Canvas, like a, maybe a, a peer review on Canvas. Okay, so these are just some ideas. Um, if you want to take a screenshot of this, it will be great. If you, we will be probably sending you handouts on all of this, no? So you will have some of these ideas um, emailed to you at the end of this webinar. Okay. So here we have some visual way sequence. Now, as we approach towards the last um, last topic, is on once you decided what would be the alternate assignment, it's important to give students instruction so they know how to work on it, right? So here we have um, redesigned our assessment. And students will, have, will probably ha need to know what is it, why is it important, changing it, how will this benefit them, right? You need to be very transparent and very honest that this is the kind of assessments that we are doing just because of the situation we are in. When is it due? Can they work with others or who can they work with? Is it an individual or group assignment? And where do I submit this? Right? Again, be very cognizant that the students are online, you are online, some of these might be new to them, new to you. So try to think ahead all the five W's. Now, what is it? Why is it important? Why do we need to make this change? When is it due? Who can I work with? Where to submit? Now that's not enough. Now that you wrote this down, right? You probably need to make an announcement to your class. Give them the resources to, to, to support them in the new form of assessment. And be very clear on how they will receive feedback and what kind of maybe scoring criteria or rubric you would use to give them their final grade or their final scores. Right? So Thinking about this, an assignment or assessment never lives alone. You typically have to follow through the assessment in an online situation with a push, which is announcement and information. And then later on, you, it comes back as feedback and some kind of measure of, of learning. Okay, so 